Welcome to Disruptive Successor, a show for next generation leaders in family businesses and entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the status quo and take their existing business to a whole new level. We all know that what got us here isn't going to get us there. This show will provide inspiration, advice, and resources to help you create massive impact. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Hi, it's Jonathan Goldhill, and welcome back to another episode of the Disruptive Successor Show. I'm recording this and future episodes on the other coast. I'm in New York and uh, just came out from L.A. for the summer. And my guest today is a serial entrepreneur, investor, outsourcing expert, father and husband, who is expert at scaling up businesses and managing growth, competition and innovation. Based outside of Bozeman, Montana, his companies combined for an annual total revenue of $40 million, managed by a team of just under 25 people. Joe Rare builds companies that allow him to create freedom in his time within weeks of starting these companies. Currently, he owns four digital companies, five wedding venues, and real estate investment properties, while his main business is providing outsourced virtual assistance for remote work. He has truly achieved work-life balance as an entrepreneur and is going to share with us some of his strategies for doing that because Joe starts with the end in mind. Joe, thanks for coming on the show today. I think you're going to have a lot of really instructive stuff uh, for entrepreneurs and for family businesses who might be stuck in a pattern of believing that their business has to be a certain way. And you, you've done a real paradigm shift with the way you start your business. So so welcome to yeah. the show, first of yeah, all. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, yeah hopefully yeah. I, can, I can support someone out there. Oh, yeah, sure. no, I'm sure you can. And I I love what you're doing and what you're about. Um, You built a really successful company, but you've ne- managed to now scale a number of businesses to seven figures and beyond. And you bring a really unique mindset, I think, to that. So tell us a little bit about the mindset that you bring to a business and and maybe a little bit of background about how you got started in your first entrepreneurial business. Yeah, I mean, to go back first, um, you know, I think I I think I was in high school and and Rich Dad, Poor Dad had just been released um, back in the late 90s. And um, it, it struck me. It was, you know, it was very obvious that this was, you know, kind of the path that I was going to take is this uh, owning businesses. Um, my parents were not financially sound or, or you know, um, educated financially. Um, so, you know, their path in, in financial abundance was was very, you know, probably like a lot of a lot of people is just they just didn't have that that financial education, the desire to improve that, you know, aspect. So we grew up with, you know, not a lot of money. We weren't by any means poor. Like I'm not playing that story, but I realized that there was so much more. There was so much more that I could do. There was so much more that I wanted to be able to do. Um, you know, and in this small town that I grew up in, which was a small little farm town, there's 3000 people, you could see who had the most time and the people who had the most time were the people who owned businesses. And I specifically remember one time, I, I, gosh, I had to have been 12 or something. Um, a friend's dad took us to a baseball game. And I realized it's the middle of the day. And I'm like, wait a minute, my, my parents had to work. And so like, how does he do this? And you realize like he owns one of the biggest companies in town. And there was, and it was something about that that has always resonated with me. And so from there, it was educating myself as much as I could. Rich Dad Poor Dad really opened my eyes to just the entire concept of, of money and building businesses and 
investing and all of that. And so from there, it was a no brainer that I was going to go start companies. I was going to start businesses. Um, and I actually dropped out of college to do so um, and started my first business, which was a door to door sales business, which is uh, a good way to get your feet wet if you want to learn how to sell. And then um, I was able, you know, luckily after a couple of years, be able to sell that business. Um, and then that took me and got me, allowed me to get into real estate. And so that was kind of the, that was the official beginning of where I started. Okay. So let's just back up a little bit because yeah. probably half of our listeners don't know anything about Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. Okay. Okay. And yeah. so why don't, you know, why don't you share your interpretation of the book and then I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll add some, uh, some additional color to it. Well, I think it's, you know, a couple of the biggest lessons are, are really understanding the difference between assets and liabilities. And that was something when I picked up the book, I hadn't even heard those words before. So I didn't even really understand. Um, you know, it wasn't until I was in the eighth grade before my parents bought their first home. So, you know, buy, buying a home is like the American dream, right? But most people don't understand that buying the American dream is technically a liability. It's something that takes money away from you. So there's at no point the home that you live in is an asset that puts money in your pocket. It constantly costs. There's maintenance, there's taxes, there's um, you know, utilities and everything else that goes with it, it never puts money in your pocket. There's not rent being paid. So understanding that difference by itself was a magnitude of, of difference between my family and where I am. And, and I mean, still, I mean, it can be, you know, my siblings and everything else, you know, not all of them are in the same boat that I am and do the same things that I do. Um, everybody, most people have jobs, right? J-O-B, just over broke. Right. Most people don't build assets and build things that can operate and produce income without them present. This was a big, a big deal. Again, going back to my childhood, seeing that friend's dad who was able to take time away and go take us to a baseball game in the middle of the day, the middle of the week. It was like, how can he do that if he's got a job, if he has to work like everybody else? And I didn't under, you know, it was, it was later understanding he built something that he didn't have to operate and it still produced income. That was an asset. And so understanding that, I, I clearly knew that it was, I had to get into building businesses that could operate, produce cash flow, um, get into real estate so they could do the same. So, you know, the premise of the book, understanding the difference between liabilities and assets, understanding the difference, um, you know, later it comes into, you know, the second book, the cash flow quadrant, understanding the different, the four different quadrants that people operate in, whether you're an employee, self employed business owner, or an investor, understanding where, the money lies in those, and not saying that money is the, the end all be all success, but money creates time. And so, my biggest factor that I, that I strive for is freedom of time, right? Financial resources create time. And so, that's really what, you know, what, what has driven me for years. That's great. So, all right, I think we covered enough on the book. Um, <laughs> understand that there's two central characters in the book. There's a rich dad and the poor dad. Correct. The rich yeah. dad is the one who buys real estate. Yeah. And he buys real estate not to live in, but to produce enough income so that he can afford to buy a house to then live in it. Yeah. The poor dad, I think, if I recall correctly, was like a high school teacher. And no, he was, uh, a, he, dude, he was the head of education for the state of Hawaii. In the okay, place, right. right? So, I mean, high powered, you know, job, okay. right? government employee. But, you know, every time he got a pay raise, right, they upgrade their house, they upgrade their lifestyle. And right. so he's always living paycheck to paycheck and so forth, never becoming, you know, abundantly wealthy. And so the idea of don't buy the stuff that you want until you have assets that can pay for them. That's, you know, that's a huge lesson understanding the difference. And so, yeah. So in the book, I mean, there's a rich dad who's his best friend's dad, uh, you know, his biological dad, who's his poor dad, poor dad being like, Hey, he's still a high paid government official, but he's broke because he doesn't buy assets, build assets, own businesses and right. all that. And hence Versus the term his job dad. just over broke, J-O-B, right. That's it. Okay. I, right. I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're not to say that there aren't some jobs that are, that have levels of success to them that are, that create financial wealth, but it's typically what people do with their income from those jobs. And that puts them in that investor category, right? right? So, right. you know, you can play and be a, you know, an employee in E in that E quadrant, but you need to be an investor. And most people go, Hey, I'm going to, put it in my 401k, which 
we can right. get into a, a, an entire podcast about the danger right. of that. But of course, we need to understand, even as entrepreneurs, that we need all types of people to make a business successful. Because if everyone was an entrepreneur, no one would be working for anyone else. No one would get anything done. So we need Correct. entrepreneurs who uh, we need people who are small business owners who take care of, lo- you know, provide locally needed goods and services. And they're not looking to build an empire. Um, they are probably want freedom of time. So we're going to get into that in a moment. And yeah. then there are managers and there are workers. And so we need all types to be of able to, to build a system. So, all right. So most business owners, particularly family business owners, they start a business, they try and grow that business. They fight the bloody fight to get, you know, cash flow positive. It might take a few years. Eventually, maybe they're starting to build some success. Sometimes they don't get that successful and they're working a job, if you will, for many yeah. years, even though it's their own job. Um, but it's just they've substituted income um, from a job to be self-employed and be kind of a prisoner in their or a slave, if you want, if you want, to their own business. And you approach your business ventures very differently because you begin with the Stephen Covey phrase with the end in mind. And yeah. you're thinking about how can I build this business, scale it and exit myself from the business, but right. still have it as an asset producing income. And right. that's a very different mindset. Yeah. And, and I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like I, I was some genius and created this. It was through failure that I figured it out. It was through doing it the other way and having a business that took all my time and getting in the rat race of believing that I'm supposed to, as the owner, I'm supposed to show my team that I can work the 15 hour day that I can do that. And it was at the sacrifice of relationships and family and, and, you know, my own health and and all of that, that I would invest my time at that level, even though I, I didn't need to, there was no, I mean, I had no, nothing to prove. Right. And I think mm-hmm. that there's this weird, there's this weird idea that people have that the business owner needs to be the hardest working. No, the business owner needs to be the smartest working. Right. Because if he's the smartest working, he's going to put more effective people in, into operation that can accomplish more than he can by himself, um, more than he can in his own role. And so in, in me building in the reverse, I, already, I made the mistake. I knew that I did not want to work 14 hour days or, or whatever. I didn't want that lifestyle. I wanted time freedom. I wanted financial freedom. So the asset, the business that I'm building has to create enough income to give me the freedom. That is a fact. However, it doesn't have to have me involved in it if I can get other people to do the part that I would do. And so all of the businesses that I touch now, everything that I do, even investments and partnerships and whatever else, if it doesn't fit the lifestyle I desire, then I don't touch it. And so now that doesn't mean that I never lift a finger. Um, What it means is that I have to see the exit and I'm okay with saying, hey, family, I am launching this new thing. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to work on this and I'm going to grind it out. And it's going to be two, three, four weeks of during the workday because I don't dabble into the night anymore. Right. It's going to be the workday and I'm going to I'm going to work my face off, get this done. But at the end of this four weeks, it's back to dad being dad. And I'm always around and all day long. I'm showing up at school for no reason and whatever else. Right. But I build in the reverse. So I right. do a lifestyle and I build the business around that lifestyle. So, so all the think- exit. First. Right. But do you think that there are certain businesses that lend itself better to that model? So you've been focused on digital businesses, but yeah. you know, we were just talking before the show about specialty contractors. I was meeting with a landscaper to get a bid. I've worked and coached tons of landscapers and many of them as an example, because I, I pick an industry that we can all really relate to. Many of yeah. those guys start a business with a mower and a truck and mm-hmm. then maybe a helper. And then if they get a little more successful, they get four or five helpers. And yeah. and then if they get you know even more successful, they have you know, a team of 10 helpers. And probably by the time they get to a team of 10 helpers, they now need a manager who can manage 10 and then he can scale to 20. That's the typical small business path. Exactly. Now, the challenge with doing it that way is you built the business, then you're attempting to get your life back. Right. It's a rat race. The opposite. What, What would have been smarter? What would have been smarter is if he never mowed. Right. And he just went and got three helpers. His only job was go get new clients. Mm-hmm. 
right? You're, you're getting new clients. That's all you do is get new clients. The helpers, right. you know, whatever the mowers mow, you get new clients. Eventually it's very easy to take one person and put them into the sales role and their job is to go get new clients. And now what do you do? Well, now you're managing or whatever. Well, okay. So now you put somebody in place to manage, but it's always with the intent to exit rather than I'm mowing and I'm trying to close new business but I don't have another helper. And usually one of the reasons is, is financial resources. Most people are starting businesses lacking finance, financial resources. They're, you're mowing because you need to actually make money, right? And it's yep. more money for you if you only have one helper instead of three. And so that's how most people are beginning because they, they're, they're afraid or they're unwilling to map forward far enough to realize that if they got three helpers and all they did was sell, they'd collect way more money. Way more money. I mean, if your only job eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, whatever it is in the beginning, was to sell and bring a new business, knowing that fulfillment was handled, it'd be easier. But it makes it, it makes it difficult when a lot of the people that might get into a business like that are good at the technical stuff. They're, they're technicians. Yeah. And I used to say they're technicians masquerading as entrepreneurs, but, you know, they really just because they know landscaping or plumbing or whatever the specialty contractor is, it doesn't mean that they know how to run the business. And so they don't bring that mindset of being a business owner or an entrepreneur to yeah. it. Well, there's the uh, and, two. What 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 and, book is it that's got the two different personality types in the business, the visionary and the integrator? Yeah, that's the rocket fuel from rocket EOS. Fuel. Mm hmm. I believe that a hundred percent. And so instead of partnering my business, because I typically try not to partner the companies that I start, right. instead of partnering and trying to get an op, uh, you know, an operator and integrator, you, I hire integrators. Correct. And Understood. that's an easier way to do it. So you find somebody who's the opposite of you. And in, in the case of a business that doesn't have a visionary, most yeah. likely you're going to end up partnering. So, I mean, I think that's the difficult part because a lot of the, while I've read Rocket Fuel and I know the, all the books in the OS and, and implement and use some of those uh, frameworks in with my clients, many of the companies that I see, many of the family businesses don't seem to fit neatly the visionary integrator model. They seem to be someone who, who started a business because they thought they could replace the income stream doing it for themselves and doing it smarter or different. And but isn't that a vision in itself? It it is a vision, but it's not the kind of vision that, you know, where you're coming back every day or you know, or every week from uh, from meeting with people and having great ideas and you wanting to implement these changes and and you you can't keep up. No one can keep up with all the ideas that you have. So you need someone who can corral those and go yeah. do it for you. Yeah. Um, so I think that sometimes you talk, you use the word partner. I think sometimes these, what, what you might call visionaries, what I might call just small business people need to find another partner. And that could be a family member. That yeah. could be a friend that yeah. could be, you know, someone else. And they struggle to find coach. that partner. It could be a coach. It could also I'm, simply be 100%. a coach. And I yep. think, I think that's where a lot of probably, you know, family businesses even um, forget is that you don't have to bring somebody in house. You can right. use just a coach that becomes your visionary. Right. And, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of uh, family owned businesses, they're in it because, hey, you know, it's easier to open my restaurant and do it myself than it was for me to constantly be, you know, making somebody else their money and not, mm -hmm. you know, living my dream and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but landscaping business as well. And it, it'd be great. Hey, I understand how to operate this sucker to the T. I don't know how to get it to the sky. And if they want to get it to the moon, maybe it's a coach that's the best bet for them to go, hey, did you know that we could create this? You could take you here. You could get yourself here. This is possible. And then help you map the, the plan to do so. 100% agree. And that coach has got to serve as a, a, a person of inspiration and motivation yeah. and hold that person uh, that, they're, that they're coaching accountable. And I think they can drive some success, but ultimately that motivation has got to transfer because it's to the, you know, to the individual, cause it's got to come from within. Right. 100%. You know, yeah. what was it? Like Zig Ziglar said, like motivation is like bathing. You, you need to shower for every day. Cause it's just, you gotta, you gotta create it. You gotta build it yeah. yourself. 
Yeah, um, absolutely. So, so real estate, I think, is a very different animal. And I've coached <laughs> some people in the real estate business. I find it easier to coach people who are managing people. So property management companies, you know, I've done some coaching, but it's not my my gig, you know, coaching people who have a, to build their own book of business, be they mortgage or residential real right. estate or commercial real estate programs. But that's not my jam. But I think people who own real estate investment properties and follow that Kiyosaki model, mm -hmm. um, they they recognize the how income is produced. And they they lie outside of that. I, I don't think of those as businesses. I think of those as like investment vehicles. Um, yeah, so very, would, very, very different sense. versus yeah. the versus like the business that you have. That's the bulk of your business, right? The VA business. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really requires managers who can manage yeah. people, people who can sell the business and people who can deliver the business, you know. When you involve people in a business, it gets it's messy. Very, it gets messy. <laughs> it's very different than managing, you know, real estate portfolios yeah. and managing plumbing and you know roofing and landscaping and yep. you know and you know collecting rents and things like that. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. I think that I always joke. You know, I'm in the I'm in the business of humans. Is you know what a VA company is, right? Yep. We're a staffing agency essentially. Yep. And so it's dealing with humans on each side of it all day. So we have, you know, on one side, we have to go get our clients. On the other side, we have to go get more staff right. to support these clients. And so it's never ending recruiting, selling and recruiting and selling. But then in the middle, it's all human management. Exactly. And so I always like to say, I'm like, everything's messier with humans. Yeah. Right. And it's really difficult to manage humans with more humans. And so we try our best to leverage technology in every place we can so that at least there's oversight, there's you know um, processes that can be reviewed. They, we can see everything that's happening and actually make adjustments based on data rather yeah. than just a human to a human to a human, right? Yep. Then you end up with a telephone game. And by the end, it's something completely different. So, talk, so to me, yeah, yeah. talk to me about business process standardization. Like... When you thinking about your VA business, how much time or what percent of the manager's uh, positions are they focused on business process standardization and dialing that in? And I mean, just talk from your perspective about we, the value have, of that in a business. Yeah. So we have um, so like for us, SOPs are, are super important, right? Mm -hmm. um, standard operating procedures. Very, very important to know how somebody is supposed to do their job, their, their role, whatever their role is, how is it supposed to be done from top to bottom? And as something new comes in, do we update that? Um, everybody in the company is very much in the understanding that they have to keep their SOPs up to date. Mm -hmm. right? And then once a month, there's a check-in, hey, has anything changed? Do we need to update your SOPs? The entire intent behind that is the you know the the idea that if somebody gets hit by a car could we continue to operate as if they were there and so in one division or one service group as uh, you know if if the leader of that group whatever the management staff the team lead what whoever it is if they were gone out of nowhere no we have no idea it's happening could could we still operate that as if they were still there and that is the point we need we we strive to get to. We're never perfect, but we strive to get to that same point every single day, every single month. We're really working on making sure that every aspect of the company can operate with or without somebody there, right? Could we pick somebody up and move them into that role? They follow the procedure and then they know. And also when it comes to opening and, and building more businesses, we take the exact same model. So if you were to look, not really a way to look, but if you were to evaluate the back end of my virtual assistant company versus my marketing agency, the way we operate the back end of both of those companies are identical. So I could pick up somebody here, drop them into the role over here, and they could get going right away because it's exactly the same. So our standard processes are identical. And we, we make it a big deal because it's the only way that you can scale without rebuilding constantly. 
And we've done it the other way where you're constantly, every time you want to make a move and you want to grow, well, we have to tear that down, rebuild it because we've never been this size before. We've never done. So every time that we're trying to create something, we're doing it at the next level of scale. So can we build this with a thousand people? Once we hit a thousand, can we build this for 5,000 people? Okay. Well, that's a huge difference. So then we just can, you know, constantly evolve and grow with that. But, but I mean, don't you find that there's a balance that you have to, you have to spend, you have to figure out what's the balance between process standardization and spending time oh, and, then there, yeah. and, and driving growth and getting sales and doing the business. And so um, I think it's different as I'm thinking out loud for different businesses and different stages and sizes of the business. And, and uh, I think for some small business owners, it's hard to rationalize putting a lot of time in the, into oh, that. Yeah. And that's usually when they come to me and they usually say, I need help with putting processes together. And, and so, so they get to a pain point though. That's the interesting thing. Yep. They get to a pain point where now all of a sudden, and, and, and let's like back up for that thought. What's the reason that they can't justify taking time away to build the processes and standardize everything. Usually the reason is, is because they know if they back away, it's going to either reduce their income, right? It's going to reduce their sales or yep. a, a part of the business is going to suffer in exchange for them taking time away to go build their SOPs and, and standardize their entire business. Mm -hmm. well, until they hit enough pain and then they're willing to sacrifice money to work with a coach. Yeah. And interestingly enough, they still end up in the exact same place, which is, one sacrifice in order to take time and actually do it. And then you probably sit there and say, well, no, sorry, got to do it. Right. And then, so that, that is something that I always think is kind of interesting is can, can somebody think forward far enough to realize that at the end of the day, there's going to be a sacrifice made in order to execute what I want to execute. I can either sacrifice money today or money tomorrow, time today or time tomorrow, no matter what that sacrifice is going to be made. The difference is going to be, does it require somebody else to tell me to do it? Or can I actually sit down and do it myself, build out these processes? Um, but then it could be also lack of knowledge and lack of understanding of how to do it. Building out processes for a business is difficult. Definitely. Right? Time, and time, time consuming. And sometimes, time -consuming. I mean, I used to try and find people who were outsourced people that could help build processes. But I think most of my clients, when I would introduce these people said, I'm basically doing this myself. They're, they've given me like a word document format or they yeah, you know, give you a little guide, but it was right. like, you know, and they were struggling. And I, I think that depending upon the size of the company, it's a lot easier to put it, those processes into place as you get larger. And then the difficult part is to recognize that they change also, you know, every few years as your business is changing, the processes are changing. So it's, it's constant uh, innovation. Well, I think it's also an adoption, yep. right? So what are your non-negotiables? Some of our non-negotiables are that SOPs have to be up to date. Right. Okay. That's a non-negotiable. Right. So if that's part of your religion within your company, and it's something you're super proud of and you're super motivated about to know that you could bring in, I mean, it's so much easier to say, well, I need to bring on two more people to accomplish this. And then it turns out, well, guess what? We had the SOPs in place, the processes are laid out. This person can step in, they can follow, they can understand exactly what to do. They get up to speed. It costs you less money to bring on a new person because it always costs money, but it costs less money and less time to bring somebody on because the process is dialed in. And most businesses will not adopt that as, you know, as religion within their company and make that something that's a non-negotiable. And if you do, when you grow, when you get to any other level in your company, you bring somebody new on, everything costs less. Recruiting costs less, placements cost less, training costs less, everything costs less to get them up to speed. So oh, doing it now as yeah. early as you can and continuously putting a little bit into it over time will save you a ton of money over the yeah. long run. So, yeah. So it's interesting. Now you moved to Montana. Um, is this recent? A few years two, ago, two years, two and a half years ago, yeah. And where were you before that? Northern you, California. Okay, so in a metropolis like San Francisco or okay. Sacramento, or we lived. We you know, what's really funny is where we lived in Northern California was almost. Uh, it was a very similar town to where we live in now. Interesting. Which here we live um, in Southwest Montana. So there's 1,100 people 
technically in the town that we live in. It's very small. And in the town we left in Northern California, there was like eight, uh, almost a thousand. Oh boy. So okay. Very similar towns almost. Uh, and I think that's what gravitated, why, why we gravitated here was that it was so similar. Both of them are like rural farm towns. Um, it's, it's where, you know, my wife and I both grew up in small little farm towns like that as well. And so now here we go, a whole new state and it's like the same place. Um, and, and it's interesting. And you find yourself involved in businesses that typically someone will be living in a major metropolitan area, putting wow. a business together, like a digital marketing agency of course. or, uh, so, you know, obviously running a, a farming business wasn't something you were looking to do, I guess. Not right? yet. We okay. uh, no, we're looking, we're, we're still looking for larger property mm-hmm. so that we will probably have a full, full scale ranch. Interesting. Um, most likely cattle with, uh, horses and um we'll see it, i mean is, in is that time, a profit making a uh, business these days not. or so it, <laughs> absolutely right, it's absolutely so it's it's more akin could we you know it, it's funny i i I'm, I'm always i've always been a prepper to a degree and not in the crazy sense like i've got my go bag and everything else not that we really do mm-hmm. but we do um but not that we're you know we're we're like crazy and and all that but you know, we, we do like the idea of being prepared for what happens if, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, we can get into all these things. Like they just had some grids hacked, um, you know, not long ago. And what would happen if, if everybody lost power, how could you survive? What would that look like? Um, what if grocery stores ran out of food? I always think about the impossible. So how could things go if they didn't go well, right? What if financially, I mean, we just saw some major banking, yeah. collapses. Yeah. And if you listen to some people who are kind of in the middle of it, we're going to see a lot worse. So what would you do if your bank suddenly shut down and you had no access to money? It's those kinds of things, you know, I want my I want my children to understand how a farm works. You know, they could they survive? Could they grow their own food? Could they, you know, b- raise animals to, you know, for food, if we had Mm -hmm. to, Mm -hmm. um, could we go up into the mountains and, and, you know, kill an elk if we had to, um, I I want, I want my family to be able to survive under any circumstance. It's call it a hobby as much as it is. It's definitely not a money-making operation. Um, I think those days are long gone where, you know, cattle ranches are these huge, you know, profit making type of businesses. I think those days are over, but what I do think you'll find is more and more, ranches like that going direct to consumer yes and creating a very healthy life for themselves right whether that be they're doing it through poultry or they're doing it through you know through cattle or or whatever else um there's there are people around here going direct to consumer and they're doing just fine um but they're not they're not building eight figure companies so right Right. you know well it's interesting i mean you know look at the business that you're in and 20 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I don't think you could have run your businesses from a, a small town in San Probably Francisco not. or Montana. You know, yeah. I mean, 20 years ago, maybe longer. But the all the conversation was about the last mile. And could you get broadband, you know, you yeah. know from, well, you know, being outside? true. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's been I mean, this is this is actually an interesting point is even here in Montana, you know, we're in rural Montana. Right. So we watched as they uh, right after we moved here, they were bringing like broadband south and they was coming down, you know, towards us and they stopped about two, three miles back and then it stopped. So the Internet that we had access to is called line of sight. Basically, there's a tower way over there and we have a dish and that dish has to be pointed towards that tower. And as long as nothing's blocking the view, we should have it. You get a bad snowstorm. You get hardcore thunder and lightning, like something knocks it out. I've been on podcast interviews where I just cut out and I'm gone. Wow. I've had it before. Well, now we backed ourselves up and we have Starlink. And so we have Elon's company. Mm. And so Starlink is now, we can have it no matter what. All it needs to be able to do is point to the sky. And we've got it. And you know, when we travel in our RV, I can take that with me. I can put it up on the roof and we have internet anywhere Amazing. we are. Amazing. Yeah, it's fantastic. So yeah, I mean... Now, I mean, the capabilities are incredible, but it was only a couple of years ago that we didn't have access to the, the high speed internet, even out here in Montana. Fascinating. So didn't even know that uh, Starlink existed. I don't think I knew of that company by Elon Musk. 
So, oh yeah. It's uh yeah, it's been, it's been pretty remarkable. Been- My brother travels a lot with his fifth wheel. He has the, the mobile version. Mm-hmm. So you can just take it, you set it outside your RV and you have internet. Unbelievable. Not- At good yeah. speeds too. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I'm on it right now. This is it. Great. All right. Yeah. All right. So what's next for you? What are you excited about? What uh, oh, what are you man. looking at that's really interesting to you? We, well, right now we've got a, uh, a real estate project that's going. We're adding a second home to one of the lots that we have. So there's construction going on and that's always exciting and stressful at the same time. We're looking for more property. Um, I'm in the process of launching a company right now. Um, we just actually collected uh, income for the first, uh, for the first couple clients, which is kind of cool. So now it's like flat out, Hey, this pe- people are actually paying us money. So this actually works. Um, the space that's ex- what's that? What space is it in? It's in the digital marketing space. Okay. And so again, it's still in that space. It's where I have a lot of, you know, I've got some influence. I've got, you know, a, a pretty solid network. Um, it's serving small businesses. Um, pretty much in any market in the country, which is phenomenal. It's going to, um, I think this business is going to be the one that probably truly scales to the moon, um, possibly an acquisition when we're done. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's, uh, the, the, the infant stages of it, the ideas and how can we make this a profit center and how can we make it, you know, provide an exceptional value for our clients. That kind of stuff is what I really, really love. Once it's operational, it's running, I put people in place and then I step out and go, okay, now what's next? Because the, the part, the infant, the, the idea part of it, the vision of it, that's the stuff that I really, really love to do. The day-to-day operations, I kind of, yeah, I don't, I don't love that. That's definitely not my I, wheelhouse. I figured as much. Tell me a little, tell me and our audience listeners a little bit about yourself personally. Um, yeah. You're married, you have kids, you you know. What do you, how do you spend time with your kids? What, yeah. what, what kind of things do you teach them? And how do you balance all these ventures with, uh, you know, with your life so that you free yourself up? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So as a, I mean, as a family are, again, my number one thing was always time. It's there's, there's nothing more valuable than being around your children. So no matter what they're doing, as long as you're around them, it's it's very very healthy for them. Um, you know, we we talk openly about pretty much everything. I mean, it's kind of funny. We we joked the other day. My wife and I was like, we can never s- tell a secret because our kids are just like they want to know. They're there and they're involved and they're so used to us having these open dialogues at all times that. Um, that if we didn't have that open dialogue, it kind of makes them seem like, wait, what, what are you guys doing? Um, so we're very just open and honest. We talk, you know, we talk finances in front of them. What um, ages are we 10. talking about? Eight to 10. Okay. Eight and 10. Yeah. Okay. Um, they are obsessed with trying to earn money and lemonade stands. Um, they want to, you know, one of the reasons we got chickens is they want to walk around and um, to our, our neighbors and sell, sell eggs, um, which I think they're going to do amazing at. Uh, they're phenomenal at fundraising. So whenever there's something with their school or the the community and they need to raise money, they love to go to the neighbors and, and ask for, ask for money. And I'm like, Hey, what a good, what a good thing to know is how to ask for money. That's great. Now, what are your thoughts on the lemonade stand as an entrepreneurial venture for an eight to 10 year old in a town of, you know, 1100 people is, is this a good business model or is it scalable? Well, again, it's, you know, it's, it's about the real estate. So right. where are you positioning yourself? Right. They found out really fast that in, you know, on the road that we live on, they can't put it in the front yard because there's no traffic. So they learned very fast. Nobody comes here. We need to go find somebody, uh, you know, more people. And so they want to move it to a location where people are in and out. And I said, well, why don't we go down to, there's one gas station here. Why don't we go down to the gas station parking lot? We'll prop it up in the gas station parking lot. You can do it there. And they'll make a couple hundred bucks in a couple hours. No way. That's amazing. Easily. You know, it's like, Hey, it's a, you know, a dollar a cup. And what do people do? Here's two bucks. I only have the five. Keep the change. Right. I mean, you know, and so I encourage them, Hey, what do you want to do? Go ahead, go get going. You know, what do you guys want to sell? Um, we were, they, they also love to give, which is a, a great thing. So when we lived in Northern California, we were outside of Sacramento. Um, one day I said, Hey, we're going to, you know, you've, 
when we've been in Sacramento, you've seen that there's homeless people and they said, yeah. And I said, so we're going to go get a hundred sandwiches and we're just going to drive around. We're going to hand them out. Mm. And they could not even comprehend why we would do that at first. And this is a couple of years ago and they couldn't understand it. Why would we go hand somebody food? And it's like, well, trying to teach them, they don't, these people don't have food, right. Or they're struggling to get food. And so they did that. And after a hundred, then they started to want to do it every day. And it became like, hey, can we go give this to that person? Can we go give this to that person? Hey, I grew out of these clothes. Is there anybody I can give them to? And it became a thing that they just want to give. And so as they earn income, I saw somebody um, sharing this before. As they earn income, they we basically split up their income. And so it goes um, 70, 20, 10. Um, so they're allowed to keep 20% of their income. 70% has to go into the bank for investments. And 10% has to be given away. And so they have to tithing at an early age. Very good. Yeah. And it's in it and it's, but they get to choose what it's for. Right. Right. And we live close to Yellowstone. So there's lots of, of fundraising that goes into, you know, um, things around animals and things around wildlife and, you know, uh, land preservation and all that kind of stuff. They love that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, one of my daughters told me it was last night that she's saving up for a horse. I'm like, okay, here we go. All right. She wants to buy a horse. Oh boy. And so I said, fantastic. Here we go. You better make, you better sell a lot of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so yeah. And then, you know, as stuff, what we do, I mean, we were an outdoor family, so it's, you know, I mean, it's the doors are open every day to our place. Kids are running, dogs are running. Mm. Um, we snowmobile in the winter, side by sides, camping, all that stuff in the summer, lakes, rivers, any, anything outdoors. Sounds like it's a great lifestyle. So. It is. It's fun. And I mean, Montana gives it to us. I mean, there's not I much bet. of a better place to be than no. for outdoor stuff in here. I'm sure not. So level yeah. nine virtual assistants and most of your VAs are based overseas, I imagine. In, in, the, Philippines. in the Philippines. Every one yeah. of them. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So level nine virtual.com is, uh, is the company. Um, yeah. If anybody needs anything, check it out. You can book a call right there on the site. You can reach me. It's pretty easy. Great. There's live chat so you can text in and uh, makes it really easy to get in touch with us if you need to. Oh, great, Joe. Thanks for being on the show today. Just, Absolutely. I think, you know, I, I think that the takeaway here for me and for people listening is that the role that mindset plays and, you know, the lessons that you learned as a young adult that you just incorporated and and made sure that you were going to teach your children in a different way than the way right. you were raised. And that you know, that mindset can trump a whole lot of things. If you bring the right mindset, if you think about building a business that can be built to sell, such as the book on my bookshelf, yeah. um, it, that it can be built to scale, it can be built to transition to the next generation, and that you have to be disruptive if you're going to be successful, whether you're a successor in a family business or uh, or buying a business or being in an entrepreneurial, you know, getting into an entrepreneurial endeavor, you've got to think disruptively about the market and how to innovate and, uh, and how, how to do it differently. So, yeah, I definitely agree. I, I think there's, um, there's a lot of opportunity if you're willing to do something a little different than everybody else. I think yeah. the opportunity is, is vast. Um, yeah. Most people are fearful of, you know, kind of what's somebody going to say or what's somebody else going to think. Um, you know, this new venture that we're just kind of launching now, we haven't even, you know, haven't even launched the website yet. It, it's going to disrupt things for the marketing world. It's going to shift. It should, it, it, in good times, it's going to be supportive to most marketing agencies. But in bad economy times, it's going to disrupt some of their capabilities and some of their cash flow. Um, but you know, I built this, you know, I'm building this with the idea that good economies, bad economies were recession proof. Um, not a lot of business can say that. And we watched how it happened, you know, in, in, you know, at the beginning of COVID when things declined for a lot of people and, you know, people, the first thing that they do is they cut off their marketing. They, they pull back and it's like, no, double down, you know, and that was one of the things that we did in some of our other businesses. You know, we own multiple wedding venues. Um, that I partnered in. And one of the first things that we did, everybody in the industry pulled back. They stopped marketing, stopped advertising. 
Those are the first things they did. And we went, wait a minute here. All the brides are sitting around on their phone. They're not working. They're not shopping. They're not doing anything. So why don't we advertise to them? And so we tripled our ad budget, took all of the market share of all of our competitors, and nobody understood why we exploded in our venues during COVID. And we were doing, you know, we're doing tours by FaceTime. Hey, let me show you around. Booking weddings, booking weddings. Nobody will meet with us. So I think that doing something different than everybody else, a lot of times it's just as simple as what's everybody doing? They're going this way. Great. I'm going to go that way. And I'm going to do something completely different. I'm going to disrupt the market, disrupt my competitors. And I, I think that's one of the biggest ways that you can, you can have success in your business, no matter big, small, in between, doesn't matter. I totally agree. Double down in a recession on your marketing and on oh, your yeah. training and, uh, and build your business. Some of the best businesses that had lasted for over 100 years were started during the Great Depression, that's 1929. Right. So that's right. when everyone's zigging, you zag. They go that's left, right. you go right. So Love it. Great stuff. Yeah. All right, Joe. Joe Rare. You are one of those rare people. Your name <laughs> actually is is really your name, which I think is yes. which is great. And your approach to starting businesses with freedom as the end point. How do I build it to be free? It's a great mindset. Thanks awesome. for being on the show. Yeah, awesome. my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, folks. You know the drill. If you like this show, Please give us a good rating on your podcast listening application of choice and share the show with others. And if you aren't already, go be disruptive. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Thank you for joining us on the Disruptive Successor Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, review, and share with a friend who would benefit from the message. If you're interested in picking up a copy of my book, Disruptive Successor, go to DisruptiveSuccessor.com.